you've heard all of what has transpired in this moment. And I just want to really just kind of sum it all up and share from you from the text that you have heard from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 15 that 20th and 21st verse read by Sister Janice I want to read from the Good News translation these two verses speak to that last day of Jesus. As Jesus begins to move towards Calvary, Jesus has encountered all the hatred, the oppression. And he comes to a moment where the cross is too much to bear. And after reading this text, one would surmise that here in this holy writ that God means heaven. And in 20, it says, when they had finished mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes, put his own clothes back on. Then they laid him out to crucify him. Roman soldiers along through the city, on the way to the hill called Golgotha. And they encounter a man on their way. They met a man named Simon who was coming into the city from the country. And the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And it ends up by saying that Simon was from Serene and was the father of Alexander and Rufus. I want to share with you this morning from the subject, you are here. You are here. Let us bow, let us pray. Just now, gracious and eternal God, we say thank you. God, we give your name the praise, the glory, and all of the honor. God, we thank you for this moment that you have given to us, that you have allowed us, God, to pass by this way one more time. God, we thank you for the change. We thank you for the songs of Zion that have been sung. We thank you for the prayers that have been prayed. God, we thank you, Father God, for the ability to give back to, build up your kingdom. God, we thank you for the energy and the excitement, God, that flows in this place. We thank you for the spirit, God, that is ours because of what you have given to us through your darling son. So, God, we say thank you today. God, let us not take this day for granted. Let us not take this moment for granted, God. Some folks weren't able to make it. Some folks are dead and going on to glory. Some of us miss them and miss the phone call and, and miss the note and miss it. But God, today, we look around and we say, Thank you for the God that we see and the people that we sit next to and the love that we share all because of what you have done for us. So God, we give you glory. We give you the honor. And we give you all of the praise. It is in Jesus' name. Now God, let the words that fall from your service mouth. Fall on ground that is firm. 
God, may those words take deep root in the hearts and souls of men, women, boys, and girls, and then sprout up to be the beautiful flower that you so desire. It is in that matchless and mighty name that we pray for his sake. Amen. Amen. You are here. As we celebrate on this last Sunday, Black History Month, or African American History Month, we must ask ourselves about this whole black thing and why we continue to celebrate it even after the many years of its installation specifically slated to remember our heritage. In 1926, Carter G. Woodson gave Negro History Week, and from there we've moved and come to a month. But as I have shared with the deacons and the ministers prior to coming out, that we don't relegate this moment to just a month. That this moment of black history is not just black history, it is history. We understand that as we move through the entire year, that we celebrate who we are. The reason why we celebrate, the reason why we lift up, the reason why we honor is that we stay woke. We remember in order that we not forget. We consciously engage in maintaining our identity. Staying woke during this time, especially in these days, helps to balance this tension over the span of time between past, present, and future. We do this because if we don't, then we slip into the rut of traditionalism. Being caught in the past or the other way around by, by being fooled in, into thinking that the past is not important. Hence, we get duped into believing that we have come so far that there is no need to remember. To those that have been duped, it is referred to as a delusion that we live in a post-racial society. Mm. Mosby, remembering keeps us connected. Yeah. This moment celebrated within the church is ideal for, for it draws together and keeps us connected to our African and African American tradition of history, of religion, of spirituality. The church ought to be that place where we find our authentic selves and our purpose in life. Listen to Kelly Miller, a contemporary of W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. Listen to what Kelly Miller wrote about the church in 1908 in his book entitled Race Adjustment. He said the church among black people has been a social cosmos. It has provided an emotional outlet, a variable safety valve for people caught up in the whirling storms of life. It has been the church. It has been the source of inspiration and entertainment of movements and plans which have moved an entire nation. We are a people that are connected by head and heart. And the ways that it manifests itself is through the depth of passion for one another and the God that we serve. Some throughout the generations have attempted to have us believe that, that there is no ethnic connection nor any cultural reference to the biblical tradition. Somehow, somehow, Minister Melba, we are led to believe that everyone in the Bible is right. Mm. Mm. And if you don't believe me, think about your own perceptions. When your mind casts an image of a particular Bible character, a biblical character that you love, what color comes to mind? Here's the truth. The 
the truth that one source helps us to see clearly, and that is this. On this Sunday, that we celebrate African American History Heritage Month, and throughout the year, with, with all of the drama presentations, the spoken word, and singing helps enumerate a fuller way the presence, so fuller way for us to see the presence of black folks in the Bible. Too often, he says, we, are, we as Christians read the Bible through a Eurocentric lens. And we fail to understand that in biblical times, Africa, including much of what is remained and renamed in the Middle East, even in Egypt, even Egypt is often moved out of Africa and into the Middle East, the, the, the various religion and theological writings, and we miss the fact that many of the people in the Bible look like me and you. So it becomes critical to continue to be critical, to continue to love so deeply that we, that we always stay woke and engage in our community, that we are always moving the needle forward toward progress. God is not dead. God is very much alive if you just take the time to look around and what we have seen today. We can lift up black power this and say that I Along his way, Simon was doing what he knew he 
needed to do. Simon wasn't bothering anybody. Simon was following the religious law. Simon wasn't playing his music too loud. Simon probably had his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, with him. Simon was doing what he did best, and that was being Simon. But Simon was from Serene. Cyrene is a North African country that is known today as modern Libya. Simon was forced. Simon was from the diaspora, visiting North Africa, visiting from North Africa to Jerusalem. He was doing what he was supposed to do. Simon probably stood out from the rest of the folks that were around him because his skin color was a little bit uh, of a darker heat. But Simon experienced what, what many black men and women experience today in life, and that is being judged before being understood or being known. The Bible says that Simon was then forced, forced to be used, forced to be abused, forced and misused at the hands of the police. I mean, I mean the Roman soldiers. Simon was doing what he had come to Jerusalem to do. And that was to celebrate just as he and his family had done in years past. But today, but this day was different. There was another man that was unjustly accused for walking by faith and being obedient to his father. I need you to stick with me. On this day, the authorities opted to have released to them the one that was innocent. These authorities knew the truth about Jesus. They knew he wasn't bothering anybody. They knew he wasn't doing anything out of order. They knew that he was calling himself the son of God. They knew he wasn't the one to bother, but because of Jesus' clarity and purpose in life, he was a mark by authorities. His existence was a threat to the establishment. And as a matter of fact, his existence made his life a dark place in which to live. Jesus was a black man too, who, who, who he claimed to be, which was God, was problematic to the empire. And, and don't you know that when you begin to walk in your purpose and when you begin to walk in your promise of who God made you to be, then you're going to experience some dark days. You want to go through some hell and high water, you want to go through some trouble, there's going to be trouble that comes along your way. Because of his black existence, he was oppressed by the system. And it's fair to ask the question, well, what was Jesus being oppressed for, you might ask? He was oppressed for being what God called him to be. Jesus could not be manipulated. Jesus could not be maneuvered. Jesus could not be commodified. Jesus would not sell out. Jesus went about his way and walked in all power and authority. They hated him. They hated him and, and the empire, the, the authorities, those emissaries from Washington, yeah, from the hill, I mean, for, had broken him down by beating him, spitting on him, mocking him so much so that his cross that he had to bear was too much for him. Now, now we must look at this situation from this perspective. I need you to stay with me. I know come on, come on. this is what you want. This is this is this is this is, this is, this is. one source puts it like this. In this new year, new administration, the critical question that we must ask ourselves is, is who will bear the cross for the most vulnerable? Yeah. 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 Those who are beat down, those who do no fault of their own, are in the position that they are in, who will bear the cross of the most vulnerable? Who will bear the cross of the frail? Who will bear the cross of the chronically poor? Who will bear the cross for our children? Who will bear the cross for those in society who are in the ditch and cannot bear the cross? are treated unjustly, who will bear the cross for our orphans, who will bear the cross for the mentally ill, who will, who will most be, who will bear the cross? He 
positive message to his children, Alexander and Rufus. And Brother Major, I thought about this. I thought about this, Brother Major, and I was thinking about our men. And I was like, God, this is a good example. This is a good story for our men. Here is, here is Simon making his way through life, doing what he was called to do, expressing his religious faith in the way that he sought to faith to, to display it. And here he finds himself with his two sons. And he's moving. He's going from place to place. He's coming in from the North African country. And could it be that this is a good message not to preach today, but this is a good message for our sons and our fathers. For our fathers and our sons. To see how to respond when all of the world is against you. When everyone is on, not on your side. And everyone is talking about you behind your back. This might be the example. Respond and how to act. Yeah. And that's good news today. Yeah. So he, like Jesus, he was being Simon, was being accountable to God and walking in his giftedness. If I were to, 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 to pinpoint the moves and the shifts here, I would say that as a father, he was a man. Simon was a man doing what he needed to do. He was on the move with a powerful message, a powerful message to the masses. He was a man who was on the move with a powerful message, sending a message to the rest of the world, but setting the prime example for his sons. Oh, the significance of Simon carrying the cross. The significance of Simon carrying the cross for Jesus lets us know that, that the most important crosses that you might have to bear in life are often someone else. You are part of a larger community to which you are held accountable. You don't just wear red hats just to wear red hats because it looks good. It looks good. But you wear the red hat as a symbol to let everybody know that this is my Christian duty and my responsibility to uphold my community and be able to move and let people know, let little girls know that you can be somebody. Not just let all little girls know, but especially our little black girls to let them know that there are women out here who are strong, who are capable, who are more than willing and able to do what is God has called us to do. You are part of a larger community to which you are held accountable. God has called you to a particular purpose in your life. For this is your Christian calling. Don't be fooled, nor get it twisted, that this Christianity thing started from white, Eurocentric bodies that let you know that you weren't worth anything. In his book, I need y'all to stay with me. In his book, Black Theology and Black Power, written as a result of the civil rights and black power movements in the 1960s, James Cone states, and I quote, Unfortunately, Christianity came to the black man through white oppressors who demanded that he reject his concern for the world as well as his blackness and affirm the next world and the whiteness. I'm trying to sound like James Cone right now. <laughs> as black people helping, assisting, and aiding our community was in our DNA. It was in our DNA, the DNA of our ancestors. And when we were forcibly deported from the motherland of Africa, the oppressor tried to teach us something different over the centuries and, and make it seem as though getting assistance in the time of need is to be seen as weakness. I'm talking about giving back to the community. They and some of us have joined in in believing that getting aid for the family is something that only happens to black folks and black folks need to just stay over there and this perception furthers white people's thinking that they, we, are a bunch of lazy, shitless Negroes that need to be watched carefully. You know I'm telling the truth. I've been 
been a social worker since 1994. I know when you talk about the system and when you talk about people getting aid to their families and they're trying to get aid to get to the next point and we look at them as some uh, 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 folks that, 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 that need to be put off and, and marginalized and put off the curb because they don't deserve it. They're just trying to use the system. And yes, I get it. Some are trying to use the system. But you start it? Somebody needs to help
in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18 through 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news of the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's Savior. And we, we must be careful to know when, I'm shifting now, when to put the cross down. All right. See, the tragedy for some of us is that we pick up the cross and we never know when to put it down. Mm. We do it not so much for the purpose of helping others, but we do it in thinking that somehow it's our ticket in the heaven. We do it thinking that there, that we are the hero, <laughs> that we are the hero in it. Mm. And we do it so well that we forget about the spirit of the Lord. Yes. Mm. And we operate out of the spirit of sin. Yes. But here's the good news. You only have to carry the cross for a little while. The celebration is this. That you don't have to die on the cross that you picked up. Because Jesus already died on that cross. Jesus already paid the price for you and for me. Jesus understood it. Thank you. 